on. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I don't think I'm feeling that. Good morning, everybody. Let's stand, shall we? Let's rise up to our feet. Welcome to the worship service of the Gloucester County Community Church. We are an interdenominational, multicultural family of believers comprised of... <laughs> that was a bit anemic, all right? Comprised of... With a mission to share Christ... Good morning, everyone. My name is Samaj Hazard. I'm the youth pastor here at Gloucester County Community Church, and we are thrilled to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. It is truly a new year for Gloucester County Community Church today. All right? So we're at 1115 service, so I need you all to pull your phones out and go on that Facebook app and tag someone because we are live on Facebook. So pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. I want to see you pull it out. Pull out your phone and tag someone right now. Now, Chad, I need some help, man. I need you to come over here. All right? Now, we have one more announcement regarding mass. As to mass, if you don't feel comfortable without a mass, please, please feel free to wear it. Now, Chad, we got to get this service started. But when I asked them, you know, how many generations, they said four very anemically. So we got to get this energy up. All right? So on the count of three, we're going to say, are y'all ready to worship? And then we're going to point the microphones out, and they're going to say, yeah! So bar mitzvah style, bar mitzvah style, all right? And I noticed you're not wearing a flannel today. This is a really nice shirt, chat. All right? It's not flannel season yet. It's not it's flannel It's coming. Season yet? It'll be like next month. Next oh, month? Yeah, maybe, gotcha. maybe October, you know. Perfect. Yeah. You'll, you you'll, you'll know. Yeah, are we ready? Okay, here we go. <laughs> One, two, three. Are, are y'all ready to worship? Nah, it's not there. It's not there. It's I'm not, not there. Not, nah, not, that. not yet. Now, now, Jared, I need I need some more energy from the drums too on that end, okay? All right. Are y'all ready? We'll do this again. On on three, Chad. On three. One, two, three. Are, Are y'all ready to worship?
awesome Sunday it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm so happy to be here worshiping. Let's all sing this next one because I know you know it. sunsets free, always free in me. I'm a child of God this morning. Yes, I am. Humanility Lighthouse began in the Philippines by one of our GCCC supported homegrown missionaries, Brian and Diane Thomas. They rescued street children that were orphaned by typhoons, property of warlords, victims of human trafficking, and those whose parent was incarcerated. I had the opportunity to visit the shelter in Bogo City on the island of Cebu and was warmly greeted as the first guest in two and a half years. A welcome feast celebrated the birthdays of all the children and staff and included Leishan, suggested by a family member, its roasted pig, songs and prepared dances. <laughs> Director Mommy Colin and the girls picked me up for a refreshing dip in the ocean. 
and devotions were held by candlelight since the whole city had announced a blackout. The 13 younger boys arose at 4 a.m., eager to share the sunrise and walk on Old Pier. They had been confined to the compound throughout the pandemic until three weeks prior. The older boys shared their gifts and goals following a devotion using Taryn Wells' new song, You Don't Have to Fake It. The staff are young, experienced, compassionate, and faithful. Dragon fruit stands were planted last fall with the promise that each child would tend one and could eat or sell any harvest. They regularly prayed for and watered their stand. Other skills included animal care, gardening, bicycle repair, and assisting with the construction of a new hut for the older boys. A summer reading program was instituted with rewards such as Jollibee and Hollow Hollow, a shaved ice dessert. Students will return to in-person learning at the end of August, and as Diane Thomas writes, those of you who have children and grandchildren will understand our supply issues for our children because they just keep growing. Our new project is the Back to School Project as we hurry to provide uniforms, backpacks, shoes, socks, and gym uniforms, along with the requisite school year supplies for all the kids. It will cost us about $100 per child. Please pray for God's provision. And if you are interested in helping, you may give at www.humanility.org or through GCCC and designate Humanility back to school in the memo. It all starts with you. Join us on Sunday, August 21st for GCCC's Healing Service with Terry and Nancy Clark at 9.15 and 11.15 a.m. all that you have done We're so thankful for all you want to do We're so thankful for all that you have done So August 21st for Terry and Nancy Clark and come expecting a healing touch from Jesus. Good morning church family. Did that voice sound a little familiar? <laughs> I hope that you guys will come to this healing service. You know, you can even stand in the gap for someone that you know that needs healing. All you have to do is bring your faith. Amen. For those of you who don't know me, I am Gina Kulikowski, and I am the campus pastor here, and this is your official welcome. We are excited that you are here today. We are blessed that you chose us to worship with us, and this is an exciting day today. When you came in, you guys received a connection card. Would you all hold that up for me so your neighbors can see it? <laughs> especially if you're new, if you're a first time visitor, we ask that you would fill this card at the bottom. You'll see the welcome. 
Terry Clark's on the front. There's a welcome section on the bottom. If you are a first, second, third time visitor, maybe you've been here for the last few months and we don't have a record of your attendance, we would love to have one. So take a moment, fill that out. When the ushers come around, you can pass that in the offering basket or which we would prefer, you go through the lobby, through those doors, you will meet a smiling face and we have some gifts for you. A cool t-shirt, and a travel mug. Can we ever have enough travel mugs? No, right? Mine disappear all the time. And I said this at 915, along with our socks, our travel mugs and our socks. So I looked over at PB and I said, can we make socks that say GCCC? <laughs> Would y'all <you> want socks? <laughs> As the ushers come forward, now is the time that we prepare our hearts for the offering, for the tithes and the offering. What can I say about the tithe? I was thinking this morning about the little boy who shared his lunch. Think about that. He had a few fish and some loaves of bread and he shared it and Jesus took those and he fed thousands, right? thousands of people. We want to be part of that miracle. That is why we give back to God. Amen. Would you all pray with me for the, for the offering? Father, we love you and we praise you, God. We thank you that we get to be part of a miracle, Father, in everything that you call us to do. Father, I pray now for the giver and the gift I pray that you would bless those who give out of their need, Lord God, that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon them, Father, that they would not have room enough to hold it. Father, we lift up all those who are hurting today. We lift up those who are sick that can't be with us today. You are a healing God. So we thank you, God, that even now as we pray together, that you are touching our loved ones and healing them. And Father, we lift up all of those who have lost loved ones, Father. Father, you tell us in your word that you will give us a peace that passes all understanding. We receive that peace for those who have lost loved ones, Father. Father, we thank you so much for Pastor Blake and his wife, Lisa, Lord. We thank you that you have brought them here today. God, we thank you for the powerful message that Blake has preached this morning. Father, I pray, I pray that he would know your presence again as he preaches. Holy Spirit, fill us. Take out any distractions, Father. Fill our spirits, Father, that we may go out and be transformed in this world for you, God. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Light of the world by dark 
bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life, no fear in death This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns. All right, let's remain standing, shall we? If we indeed believe that it's in Christ and Christ alone, then we ought to make the heavens hear us. Hear me. Thank you, Samaj. Whoops, let's make sure this is right. You're almost done. We don't have to worry about this. Blake, I think you're more melancholy than me. You'll make sure that goes where it's supposed to go, right? Did I hear an amen? Thank you. You know, all other faiths tell us that you achieve some state of righteousness and maybe that God will accept you. Only Christianity tells us that God through Jesus achieved a state of righteousness with that was acceptable in the eyes of a holy God. And when we embrace the one who knew no sin but became sin in our behalf, then we receive that righteousness that's imputed to us so that a holy God sees us without sin. So we should put our hands together and applaud that God for his miraculous work. (laughs) 
All right, we can put a little light in the house, lift up the shades, go north, east, south, and west, and greet one another. Say hello. So I'd like to take a few minutes, just a few minutes, and share with you the providential history that has brought us to this day. Cheryl and I began speaking and discussion, discussing and talking about uh, a successor for us um, about six years ago. It was six years ago that God sent Blake Hunt and his wife Lisa to Las Vegas to learn ministry. If we don't learn anything else as we walk this Christian life, we learn that his denials, or I should say his delays, are not necessarily denials. And the church said, as they say in Montana, yes. So you know, those of you who have attended GCCC for any length of time, this process actually began about six years ago. Well, April of this year, as we began to aggressively seek a successor for me, I received a call from the minister who officiated the wedding of Cheryl and me. And he said to me, listen, Bruce, um, I know that you've talked about stepping down, um, passing the baton, and I have a grandson who I think would be perfect for that position. Now, you know that over the years, we haven't philosophically necessarily seen eye to eye in how we do church, but we know what we want, and that's to see God transform lives, save souls, energize saints, and that I have agreed with you along this whole journey, and I think my grandson is more like you than he is me. I just let that sit for a moment. So not only did Dr. George Rydell officiate our wedding, but it was there I met my wife on Howard Drive in Williamstown. And I'm thinking, well, how young is young? And he says, well, he's 29. And I'm going, ooh, that's really young. This is a multicultural church. And Doc says, well, I was 25 when I started at Open Bible Baptist Church, he's pushing just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll give him a call. So I called and we chatted, talked a little bit about it. And I said, well, um, Blake, you're going to have to be vetted like everybody else. So there was an organization that we had hired called Blumen, uh, B uh, Vander Blumen. Now, Vanderblumen, for all, all intent and purpose, is a dating service. If you need um, a creative arts director, they'll find you one. So when we said we're looking for a lead pastor, they started out with 90,000 pastors. Sorted it down to 42, and gave us the 42, and Blake was in the mix. And I'm thinking, nah, he's not going to make the cut. He's too young. Well... When they presented us five candidates, he was one of the five. We spent hours upon hours interviewing, discussing doctrine, discussing philosophy, discussing how to do church life. And when we were all done, Dr. Rydell's grandson was our choice. Now, I'm going to go a little further. Just hang in there with me. So we had to wade through the fact that he was 29, be 30 in August. And as I'm wrestling with God on this, God says to me, how old was Joseph? 30. How old was King David? 30. How old was King Saul? 30. How old was Solomon? 
20. I'm not sure I'm convinced yet. And God says, how old was Jesus? That was it. I had no more argument. <laughs> so let me tell you just a little bit about our history. Because the history is what God wanted to keep moving forward in a miraculous and supernatural way. The Sophia Blake heritage of filling the pulpit goes back nearly 100 years. I brought a picture of my grandmother's church in Turnersville, New Jersey. This was 1954. Can we zoom in on that? So my grandmother was born in 1894. And God called her into the ministry. I remember the church was about 45, but there weren't more, much more than 45 people in all of Washington Township at the time. We all farmed. It was a good-sized church at its time. And then God raised up Dr. George Rydell in Williamstown, New Jersey. And then out of that, he raised up Joseph Bruce Sophia. And now we believe with all of our hearts, unless something blows up between now and September the 18th, and I don't think that's going to happen, that God's choice, six years delay, was not his denial, was that the legacy of Anna E. Smith, Joseph Bruce Sophia, I should put it in order, Anna E. Smith, Dr. George Rydell, um, Joseph Bruce Sophia, would continue for another 35 to 40 years. Winning souls in Gloucester County, I often say if there's any crown of achievement that I would lay at Jesus' feet humbly, it is the fact that we have seen over 37,000 souls won to Christ in our 40 years. Now, there was one up. Now, I'll save this till you're all done. All right. I have one other thought, but we're going to let that rest. So I'd like you to meet Dr. George Rydell and his beautiful wife, Faith. Uh, they're here today. They're here. They're grandson. So Dr. Rydell, would you and Faith stand? Would you please stand? And can we give them a round of applause? All right, let us all stand, shall we? You know that there's no way we can greet this couple from Las Vegas, Sin City, and bring them to the righteous part of the world, South Jersey, without you standing. So Blake and Lisa, would you please come to the, uh, to the platform? All right, come on, if we're gonna welcome them, let's welcome them, put our hands together. Thanks, PB, so much. Uh, we're thrilled to be in Gloucester County. You guys can be seated. Um, we are thrilled to be here, thrilled to do all, see that all that God has done, continue heritage, build momentum off what everything God has done. We've been wanting to minister specifically in Gloucester County for a while now. Uh, God laid it on Lisa's heart and like a good partner, um, I just kind of followed that vision. I was open to planning a church about three years ago uh, in Ah, oh, Philadelphia, you know, Atlantic County, Camden County, something like that. I was anywhere in South Jersey, Philadelphia area I was good with. And my wife said, Blake, God wants us at Gloucester County. And I said, won't you have it? This is where God has placed us. And he scratched the plant dream. And he said, there's a special place called the Gloucester County Community Church. And you're going to minister right there. Um, you're going to hear a ton from me. Uh, so I wanted Lisa to come up and tell you a little bit about our family um, and just a little bit about us, hon. So go Absolutely, ahead. Absolutely, yeah. So, well, it's nice to meet everyone. I'm excited to meet all of you a little later on. My name is Lisa, and Blake and I have been married for seven years. We did grow up here. I am pretty local to Williamstown, and um, it's just exciting. I can't tell you. I mean, I've started writing it down. Miss Gina and I were talking about it. Miss Cheryl and I were talking about it all the 
the sovereign things that God has done just to prepare us for this moment. I mean, how unique is it that we get to say that we grew up here and then we went away to train, we went away to learn how to do ministry and hear directly from God and see our team out there have a passion for their city and get to work alongside people who have a passion for their city and now I mean, look what God has done. I get, we get to come back here and do it in our city, in a town that yeah. we love and that we are passionate about, and all of just the connections that we have. I mean, it's, it's so exciting to me, but um, I'm thrilled to get to know each and every one of you. You'll get to meet our kids later. We have two children, Liam and Eva. Liam is five, but I have to tell you, he's very excited. He turns six at the end of the month. So when you meet him, he might share yes. that. Um, and then Eva, of course, because she can't be outdone by her brother, is also excited that she's turning four, but not until November. So we haven't told her that part yet. Um, but yeah, they're very excited. They're over in the kids program right now. And they did bring things to show you because I told them they'd be meeting a lot of really wonderful people that mommy and daddy love. And uh, so Liam has his calculator to show you and Eva has a little stuffed kitty cat. So um, we're just, again, thrilled to be here. Um, I'm excited to meet each and every one of you. Everybody has been so gracious and so kind. And um, yeah, I will see you all pretty soon. Yeah, we'll see you at the JMSC right after service today. Hope to be able to meet you all, have some fruit out there and some drinks and it'll be a good time. Um, but we're here today to spend a little bit of time in God's Word because we love the Bible, right? Yeah. Wow, a 915 did so much better. Um, I, I think they just love Jesus more. I don't know. I, I, I mean, that's, that, that, that is, that's, that's rough. I don't, I don't know what's happening. I mean, we love the Bible at Gloucester County, right? Like, yeah, yeah. We're, we're ready to teach God's Word. Um, I got a question for you before we jump in. Like, how many of you have lost something and found it in like a super unexpected place? Like, you ever like open the fridge and find your keys? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, like you open the fridge, find your keys. You know, um, you ever like pick up your kid's bed and then you find, good Lord knows what you find under your kid's bed, but like a full pineapple or something like that, like something crazy, okay? Like th this, this is happening all over the place. It's definitely a big thing with dads, of course. We lose our wallets. So around this time last year, in fact, May of 2021, um, I was coming out here to do my brother and sister-in-law's wedding. And about four days before the trip, I walk out of the house and I do the man check. You guys know what the man check is, right? Phone, keys, wallet. Okay, phone, keys, wallet. And I go, phone, keys, wallet, gone. Wallet's not there. This is four days before we fly from Las Vegas to Philadelphia to do the wedding. So things begin to rush towards my mind. I was like, I'm not only just have to call my brother and tell him he's not going to have his brother at his wedding. He's going to have to find a new pastor to do his wedding. He's going to have to find all of these things. I'm freaking out. You know, I, I, so I call the credit card companies and I, and I pick up the, uh, I cancel on my card, right? I, I'm, I'm, I have a picture of my license on my phone. So I print it off on a big eight and a half by 11 sheet. So I'm thinking, all right, worst case scenario, I get to the airport. I show up with this big eight and a half by 11. I don't have the card that I paid for the airplane on, they're definitely going to think that I'm not Blake, that I'm the guy who stole Blake's identity, right? Like this is, this is who they think I am, I am at this point, okay? So um, I'm freaking out. I, I, I went ahead and I ordered all my cards, got them expedited to me. You know, one day my cards were there. I said, okay, breathing a little bit easier. And then it dawned on me, it dawned on me after numerous Google searches that I am going to have to go to one of the worst places on earth. I am going to have to go to the DMV. Okay, so I, so I, I think, man, I'm, I'm going to have to go to the DMV, and, and, I, and I go to the DMV, and I, I pull in the DMV. I have my, my, you know, my identity theft ID, okay, printed out, and I have my cards, and, and I'm ready to walk in, and I walk in, and they, they put me in a virtual queue, okay? Did you guys move to that during, during pandemic times? All right. Well, in Las Vegas, you go in, and you, you check into a virtual queue. You don't even get to have to wait for the hours of agony in a chair. You have to literally log in and then start waiting, like, days before. In fact, I'm still in the virtual queue right now. I, I, I'm, I'm still in the virtual queue waiting to get into line. So as I'm sitting in this virtual queue, I finally get called, you know, eight, nine days later. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm moving there and I, I get up to there and I say, hey, I, I've lost my license. You know, I, I can't find it. I, I have some forms of ID. Here's a bill. Here's this. Here's that. And they say, 
Great news, Mr. Hunt. We're going to get um, your, your ID. Here's a temporary, and it'll be shipped to you. I said, fastest shipping you can get. And you know the DMV looked at me and said, three to five you know, years, um, it'll, it'll be there. And, uh, and I said, all right, fine, that's, that's fine. So I'm, I'm worrying. I said, I guess I'm just going to go for it. You know, the people in Las Vegas are nice. I, I wasn't necessarily worried about getting to Philly at that point. I thought, yeah, people in Vegas are kind. Um, I was worried about, you know, going back to Las Vegas through the city of brotherly love that's, you know, not so brotherly and, and sometimes not so lovely. And, uh, and, and I thought, this is going to be really hard. I'm going to have to, you know, Oregon Trail my way back to Las Vegas if, if I get out to Philly. But I thought, you know, I got confidence. I'll just do it. It'll be fine. The day before, I open the trunk of the car and, and I go to put the first bag in. And lo and behold, my wallet is there. I'll tell you what, make a Baptist want to speak in tongues right there. I'll tell you like, I was, I was freaking out. I, I lost my mind. Lisa heard me in the, in the, in the kitchen screaming like a little girl. I would never been more thrilled in my life. I thought I'm going to be able to, you know, do my brother's wedding, do his lovely wife's wedding and, and everything's going to be okay. And I found something in an unexpected place. Today we're going to be in Mark 10, 35 through 45, and we're going to see how the disciples found their security in a place that they never would have expected. Up on the screen, Mark 10, 35 says this, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder, how many Marvel fans do we have in the room? Sons of thunder, I can't help but but go there a little bit, okay, all right, sons of Zebedee, Sons of thunder came up to him and said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Why do they ask? You know, this has been taught in times past that they ask because they're selfish. They ask because they're inconsiderate. They're self-centered. They only think of themselves. They couldn't care less about the other disciples. Don't be James and John. But consider with me. Consider with me. The passage right before this Jesus predicts his death, not once, not twice, but for the third time to James and John. I don't believe James and John were asking out of a selfish way. We're going to see that later in the passage. James and John were asking because their security was going to be ripped away from them. I mean, think about it. The guy that they've been walking with for the last three years has just predicted his death, right? The guy that all 12 of them have been walking with, Mary Magdalene has been walking with, numerous people have been walking with, they go into a city, they'd always be fed. That guy, gone. They'd go into a well, there'd always be water. That guy, gone. He'd go into a new city, he would heal people. That guy, gone. And it's starting to pour, the emotions are beginning to pour over James and John, like, oh my word. The guy that we are walking with, the guy that we are spending time with, the guy that's provided everything for us, he's, he's going. Their security is being ripped away. And they respond with an ask, just like any one of us in the room would. When we have our security being pulled away and the fear begins to pour over our security or pour over us, fear becomes a tremendous factor in seeking security for ourselves and the one that we love. And as Jesus predicts their death, James and John realize, man, I'm going to be without Jesus. And they begin grasping at control. We've done it too. Like, like for you, for you, it's not that Jesus is leaving, right? Jesus is living inside of us. He's not going anywhere. But for you, maybe it's that little loss of security, that sense of security of something's leaving. Have you ever had a boss leave and what you do is you, you ask, hey, before you go, like, can you promote me? <laughs> right? 
um, can you promote me really quick? This is kind of what James and John are doing. They're literally like, Jesus, we understand that you're leaving, but can you push us to the left and the right hand in your glory? Because it, it seems like it's coming really soon, and, and we're really scared, and, and we're beginning to lose control. And God, you've been our security the whole time, and I understand that you're going to send a comforter. I understand that other things are going to come, but God, maybe, maybe, could you just, could you just give us something? Please, please, please. I just want to have security, a guarantee in the business, if you will. Can you help me? Can you help me? Look at what continues to happen in the story. Verse 40. And when the other 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. So the other 10 disciples begin to hear what's happening with James and John. They're asked to Jesus and they begin to get frustrated at James and John. Probably because they didn't think of it first. Okay, so they're frustrated with James and John and they're grasping at their own security and it's beginning to wave over them. But look at how our Savior answers. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, he calls all 12 and brings them around and says this, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. You know what I find interesting in this passage? If James and John were being selfish, self-centered, actually indignant, I believe our Lord would have chastised there. I believe he would have condemned there. I believe he would have corrected there. That's not what Christ does. He looks at them and says, I understand you're thinking like Gentiles. What you're doing right now, that's how the Gentiles act. That's how they think. I understand that you're starting to lose your security. I understand that you're grasping at comfort and control. I understand that you're beginning to lose it. But that's how the Gentiles act. When the Gentiles are put in a place, they begin to grasp for more. But you don't have to do this. You see, when our security is pressed, I believe as Christians and as just Americans, we do one of two things. We grasp for comfort or we grasp for control. So our security begins to become lost, and what we do is we grasp for control. I can do it! Or we grasp for comfort. Just keep everything the same. If everything's the same, if I can just eat the same, and my routine's the same, and everything's the same, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. It'll be okay. And we grasp at comfort and control rather than grasping for the Savior as the only one that can provide us security. Let me ask you this, what are those things that if you lost them tomorrow, it would make your sense of security evaporate? I've been in Las Vegas six years. The average stay of a Las Vegan is three and a half. So that makes me a true New Jerseyan and Las Vegan, okay? So I will make a bet with you in church today. Um, I will make a bet that there's something Something in your life that if you lost it, your sense of security would evaporate. Is it financial security for you? Like if you can have four, five, six, seven zeros in the bank, you're okay? I can breathe. That's what I'm going to place my security in. Maybe, Maybe for you it's career success. Like if I can be the best at what I do, I'll be all right. Family stability? As long as I have my family, everything will be okay. Is it tradition for you? As long as we can just stay doing the same thing, everything will be all right. Maybe it's transition for you. Church, you're in a, you're in a time of transition. My heart goes out to you. I've been praying for you. It's a hard time. But maybe as you think to yourself, as transition comes, I I don't know. And I'm going to grip for comfort and control where I can find it. I don't know what it is for you specifically, but I'm willing to bet you it's something. For me, this question hit about 18 months ago. 18 months ago, I was 
uh, hosting, or I was asked to speak um, in Las Vegas. Our, our church hosts a pastor's conference, and I was going to, to speak there, and, and uh, I was really thrilled. And one of my buddies from seminary, he was coming, and uh, we decided that we would go on a hike in the beautiful Red Rocks of Las Vegas. Not all of us just live in hotels and casinos on the Strip, by the way. There's like homes houses, things all around. Now, it's mostly rock, but there's still things, okay? And uh, so we decided to go hiking, and you can show the first photo there. Um, If you notice, you can see it on the the larger photo here. Me and my buddy from seminary, we were hiking over where the snow hadn't happened yet, and you could see the snow coming in, okay? So what I did is I saw the snow coming in, and I began to head down the mountain, And as I began to head down the mountain, there was a spot where I had to get lower on the sandstone. For those of you who don't know what sandstone is, it's kind of like a slate stone. And I began to crouch down, and as I crouched down, my left leg slipped out from underneath of me. I slid down the sandstone 10 feet and then cliffed off eight. Fell right on my right leg and snapped it. Fibula, tibia, compound fracture, bone through, snapped. I began, to, uh, I began to sit on the mountain and begin to contemplate all things, like light hypothermia started to set in. It was four and a half hours, almost five hours before search and rescue. That search and rescue right there could get to me, and this is what the mountain looked like now as I was coming down. And you can keep that photo up there for a while. And I began to think on the mountain, um, Lord, Why would you do this to me? Like, I'm teaching at a pastor's conference tomorrow. Like, I'm serving my life for you. Why would you do this to me? And then it got deeper. Then I got even more angry and began to become angry with God and say, not why would you do this to me? Why would you do this to my family? Like, if you take me from my family, I'm their security. I'm their comfort. I'm the provider. I can serve them best. What are you doing to them? And I began to break on the mountain as my frustration began to pile up with God and the Holy Spirit waved over me during the transition and said, Blake, I'm taking their security from them and your security from you so I can replace it with the true security of the Savior. And as, and as I sat there and as I'd gone through the multiple surgeries, the Holy Spirit continued to, to refresh in my mind. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to be in control. Because Blake, your family can't get that from there. It can only get that from there. And as we began to search and as we began to study, I began to be smacked in the face continually with this question. Lord, is there anything else in my life that if I were to lose it tomorrow, I would lose all sense of security? Is there anything else in my life that if I were to lose it this very second, I, I, I'd lose all security? And praise God, he's begun to work in my heart in and through those things. Because what I've realized is when we experience the inevitable disappointment that comes after placing security in things that are good things, and not God things, we begin to resent them. And when we resent them, we blame the item and we blame ourselves and we blame the others around us. And it turns into unhealthy and unfruitful relationships. The story continues. Jesus sitting with his disciples, they're all gathered around. He shared with them, you're thinking like Gentiles, just like I was. You're thinking like Gentiles. And then he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He doesn't contemn the disciples here. He says to these disciples who are seeking security through comfort and control, he looks at them, invites them in to a place of security that they would have never looked. He invites them into a life served to our Savior. He says, you want to find peace? 
Serve me with your life. You want to find the comfort that you're searching for? Serve me with your life. You want to find the security that only I can provide? Serve me with your life. And I can give it to you, but you don't know what it's going to take. It's going to take service of your life to find the security that we're looking for. And as Christ looks at his disciples, I believe with compassionate eyes, he looks at them and says, not only have you found security there, but I've exemplified the security you can find in service to my father. This is what he says in the passage as we look at the final verse in this passage and gave his life a ransom for many. We find security in our savior through service to our savior. Jesus served three aspects of his life. I I don't want this to be a ethereal message. I want you to walk away with an old pastor would call it shoe leather Christianity, right? Practical Christianity, okay? And so so today we're going to look at three aspects quickly um, of how Jesus gave his life in service. Jesus first, he served his large circle. He served his large circle. There are three relational circles that I want us to examine quickly, and then I'll close. Jesus served his large circle. What he did is he took his gift, his spiritual gift, we all have one, and he served the big C church, the global church, your local church. He served the church with his gift. We see this exemplified with Jesus all over the time. Miss Gina mentioned it as he feeds the 5,000 or whether he teaches on the hillside or whether he goes out in a boat and teaches. Jesus uses his gift for the church and we see the disciples exemplify this as well as they serve the church with their giftedness, their large church giftedness. And as many of you are doing, even right here, whether it's through hospitality, next-gen ministry, worship team, a VBS ministry, the tech team, whatever you're you're called to do here, wherever you plug in, we serve the church as we look to learn from the example of Jesus of how he served his large circle. Jesus had another relational circle of ministry. We call it, I call it the middle circle. Oftentimes after he'd use his gift to serve the church, he would then break his gift down in a middle circle to his disciples. So he would come off teaching and his disciples would say, Master, what was that? What did you mean? Explain to me deeper. And as, and as he began to break down through his disciples, they began to study the word of God together, began to grow with Christ together, and they began to truly sharpen each other in those moments, and they began to dig deeper into God's word. You see what the enemy likes to whisper in our ear is, your volunteer service is just fine. Like, just stay holding the sign. We need people to hold the sign. But we need people more to live their life fully on service for Christ, not just hold the sign. We, we want people to usher. We want people to serve on tech team. We want people to serve in hospitality. You want all of that. But what he calls us into is a life filled of service. And what I fear here in South Jersey is we're filled with a life full of family, but we haven't found a spiritual community that we can sit and plant ourselves in and grow through. And as we examine Christ's life, he, he looked at his large circle and he served it with compassion, but then he broke it down deeper into his middle circle, and he found a spiritual community in which he could grow deeper in, become rooted in, and blossom through. There's a third relational circle that Christ served in, and we'll close after this. I call it the small circle. So he served the church, he served his group, and he served the small circle, the individual. I can't help but think In the back of my mind, as as Jesus begins to walk through Galilee, as he begins to walk through Capernaum and he sees Matthew in the tax booth, he walks out and invites Matthew into a one-on-one relationship with him. I can't help but think in my mind as Jesus walks through and, and, and doesn't move around the town, but merely goes through it and sits with the woman at the well and invites her into a one-on-one relationship. I, I can't help but think as Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he sees Zacchaeus in the tree, as we all learned in Sunday school, and calls him down and invites him into the one-on-one relationship. As he calls Peter out of the boat to walk in faith and invites Peter into a one-on-one relationship. 
as he calls John the disciple that he loved and invites John into a one-on-one relationship. Jesus' life was filled with hard investments in one-on-one relationship. See, church, I believe something's missing. One-on-one deep relationship is missing, and I believe it's because of this. I believe my friend Steve says it best when he says, anyone can count the numbers, a number of apples on a tree, but we have to fight hard to count the trees in an apple. Okay, so, so we look at all that God has done, And we thank God for all that he's done in somebody's life and be like, wow, look at all of that spiritual fruit. But you know what's hard to do? It's hard to take one of those apples, split it open, get deep, take the seed out, and begin to plant it. And not know what's going to come of it. God, I'm just going to plant spiritual fruit because you called me to. I'm going to water. I'm going to put another seed over here. And I'm going to put people first. And I'm going to minister relationally. And God, I don't know what you're going to bring of this. Because it's really hard to see any spiritual potential. But you know what? You've asked me to further your gospel. So I'm just going to plant it in the ground. And pray you do the rest. And as Jesus walks through his life. And we examine his life. We can see him working in and through. His large, middle, and small circle. And you may sit there and ask, but pastor, uh, how? How do I start? I'd look at you and say, just just don't wait. There's many stages and ages across the church. Everybody is in a different life stage or in a different age. And some of you are sitting in the age of, man, I'm a young adult walking brand new into a new career, looking at colleges and looking at things and looking at career choices and thinking about transitioning and what do I do? And some of you are grandparents in the room that it breaks your heart because now you're not just raising your kids, you're raising your grandkids. And and, and what do I do? And, And some of you are brand new parents and you're thinking, how can I serve in this stage? I mean, the kids are so little and the kids are so small and and what am I going to do and some of you just walked into retirement and you're thinking man I got a lot of things I want to do with my time but I don't know if I really want to do that I'd encourage you church just just don't wait don't wait Christ didn't wait he pursued because of his availability service to the savior can be described in availability I'll end with this story And then PB will come up to close this. John Brody was a quarterback for the 49ers in the 60s. I know everybody is is too young to remember it, right? Okay. And uh, he was an all-star quarterback, um, borderline Hall of Famer. And uh, towards the end of his career, John Brody was subjected to being the place kick holder and the field goal holder. Not quarterbacking anymore. For those of you who don't know football... That is Lucy on Charlie Brown, okay? And he's subjected to being this place kick holder, and, and as, he, as he begins to do this job, a young reporter comes to him and, and asks him why a star player like himself would, would have to hold the ball for field goals and extra points after the touchdown. Brody answers this way. Love it. He says, well, if I didn't, it would fall over. This is the type of availability Christ is looking for you to serve him with. Look, as we transition church, I'm, I ask for your prayers. I don't know where you'll serve on the team, but I do know this. God's calling you in to serve the team right here at Gloucester County Community Church. I'm not sure what God's going to have you, if he's going to have you throwing the football or holding the football, but I can tell you this, God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and he wants to establish you right here and grow roots, and he wants you to activate these three circles and serve him, and I promise you, as you seek service to the Savior, you will find security through our Savior, and just like my wallet, it may show up in the most unexpected spot. Let's pray. Father, you are so good, and we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy.
Lord, we thank you for the Gloucester County Community Church and all that you've done and all that you will continue to do as we build momentum from the past and establish what God is doing in the future. Lord, we know that you are not dead, but you are alive and moving in and through your people at this place. We love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray always. Amen. Amen. For everyone who can, could we please stand as we bring the service to a close? So let me talk about the one point I didn't make. So Blake has not been a lead or senior pastor. So one of the questions that I got was, can he preach? Now just wait a minute. So this is what I would say. Chain breakers, you're in front of me. Just slow down. Uh, so what I said was, well, you know what? I was 33. I didn't preach regularly either. So could I preach? I don't know. I think I'm a better preacher now than I was 40 years ago. So this is what I'd say to them. Well, here's the qualifications. Is he intelligent? Yes. That means he's got something between his ears, right? Does he have something between his ears is what I'd say to them. And I'd say, is he articulate? Yes. So if he has something between his ears, right, Doc? And he's articulate. If he doesn't know how to preach, he'll learn to preach. And he'll do it well. But I thought that was the answer today, don't you? Yeah, yeah let's give a round of applause. Great job, Lee. And if I'm still alive 35 years from now, I can't wait to hear you preach. <laughs> so let's talk about availability. Where do we start? If we want God to use us and account for eternity, then he has to live in us. Because otherwise what we do is done in the flesh and our reward is here. So it starts with a relationship with the Father, through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who have yet to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, we're going to give you an opportunity. At GCCC, we say it's as easy as ABC. Admit the truth about yourself. You're a sinner. Believe the truth about God. He did something about it in the person of Jesus Christ. C, commit yourself to his righteousness, for he alone can impart it. And D, there's a day that we do it, and why not now? So for those of you who have yet to receive Jesus, could we all close our eyes, lift our heads towards heaven, and I'm going to say a prayer, a sentence at a time. And for those of you who have never received Jesus, this is your moment. And for those of you who have, I'm going to ask that you say this prayer with me because it will encourage those who have never said it. Heavenly Father, now let's all get on board. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I admit to you that I am a sinner, that I've done things that are wrong. But I believe you sent Jesus, who took upon himself every wrong, every sin. I have ever committed past what I'm doing today and what I'll do tomorrow. Come into my heart. I give you my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And the church said, and the church said, amen. Let's put our hands together for those who prayed with me this morning. Now, there's a few ways you can let me know that you prayed. You can text the word pray, P-R-A-Y, not P-R-E-Y. That's what Satan does. You can text the word pray to 856-861-4144, and I will get it. I'll send you a congratulatory letter, tell you how you can get a Bible and begin your new life in Christ. You can email bruce at gcccpray.com. Or you can complete your welcome card. On the bottom, there's a perforated section. Just tear it off, place it in the offering container, 
and check the block that says FTD. Make sure you check the block that says FTD. And that'll let me know that you prayed with me and I'll send you a congratulatory letter. If you have the time, and hopefully you do, though we'll be meeting Pastor Blake in the JMSC, but if you'd like your Bible today, come forward. We'll put your name in it and sign it. It says, this is your spiritual birthday. And the church said, amen. amen. So um, what I'm going to have you do, because many of you aren't familiar with this little piece of tradition that's so powerful. So Blake, if you and Lisa would join Christine right over here. If we could have a little more light in the house. Um, Wayne, can we light it up? That's it. Um, when soon as the uh, proclamation is over, they're going to go to the JMSC, but they're going to stay for the proc. Now, for those of you who wonder where the JMSC is, you just walk through those, those brick walls. Just go straight through like Jesus would, and it'll take you where you need to go. Martin, it's all yours. Wow, thanks, PB. Wow, I just want to say Viva Las Vegas! <laughs> and thank you very much. You know, Pastor always says you need a transition line out of the service before you do the proclamation. So my transition line is this. Number one, you must have made your grandfather, Dr. Rydell, very happy today. And number two, I know that the father is looking down saying, well done, my child. As far as the small circle, my name is Martino Cartier, and that guy looking like John Denver right there invited me about now 1988 to this church, and little did I know that I'd find myself in a place I never thought I'd be 30-some years later serving on the Creates Art t Arts team as Jesus Christ and our passion play for over 23 years and also on the preaching team. So, man, what a word from the Lord today. A couple reminders before the proc. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And those online, thank you for joining. I hope you were inspired as much as we are. Uh, also, uh, please stay in your pew until the ushers decide to dismiss you. And the chapel is open to my left. If you've come in with a need, don't go home with it. There's someone there with faith the size of the mustard seed that will pray for you. Also, any correspondence you have, prayer requests, welcome card or offering, you can place it in the offering on your way out. If you still have your card, make sure you go to the welcome lobby or welcome desk in the lobby and get your free gift, that mug or a cup. Also, lines, lawn signs, pray for America, are still available in the lobby. Now, PB the second, you ready? We're going to lead the congregation in the proclamation, both hands. I was born with value and purpose. My life has promise and potential as it unfolds in accordance to God's eternal plan. And how do we know that's true? Because the best of all, God is with you. Go and be blessed.